Mario Kart. One of the most critically acclaimed, best-selling, and in some ways most controversial video game series in history. Is it really worthy of being held up as a skill-based challenge? Or does its questionable item balance keep it more of a party game? And if it ever happened, at what point did the series cross that threshold? And either way, what is it about Mario Kart that makes the franchise so beloved across all generations and players? Seeing as a brand new entry, Mario Kart 8 is set to come out soon, I thought it might be fun to take a look back on the franchise. Mario might have broken the mold for 2D platformers on the NES, but the Super Nintendo was a whole new system with whole new features. One of its flashiest was the vaunted Mode 7 graphics setting, which allowed for a background layer to be scaled and rotated, making for a rudimentary 3D effect. It was showcased in several early games for the system, like F-Zero and Pilot Wings. Those games were fun, and they showed off the tech well, but Nintendo had yet to build a truly outstanding game around Mode 7. Intel... Super Mario Kart was released on August 27th, 1992, and what a historic day August 27th would turn out to be. Just as Super Mario Bros. set a whole new standard for 2D platforming, and Super Mario 64 would showcase all the basics of 3D platforming, everything that you would ever need to know about mascot racing games started here. The courses and characters were culled from Mario's history, and it wasn't all about racing. Mario Kart established an unprecedented item system that featured a range of unique items, which made a race about far more than just making turns. The items enriched the whole experience, and turned what could have been just another racing game into something far more strategic. Mario, Luigi, the princess, as she was known to us in the US back then, and Toad had been playable in Super Mario 2, and having Yoshi made sense too. But the game also threw a curveball in putting a Koopa Troopa and Bowser himself under your control for the first time, and absolutely beamed players in the face by bringing Donkey Kong Jr. out of mothballs. It seems pretty minor now, and that's because it's become such a standard. But having a playable cast of heroes and villains alike had never been done before. Why? Because it had never needed to be done before. I said a minute ago that Mario Kart kicked off the mascot kart racer, and that's true. But when you think about it, Super Mario Kart also set the formula for what has become the bulk of the plumber's output. The Mario Sports, Mario Parties, and even Super Smash Brothers all owe their existence to Super Mario Kart. So we've established that not only was Super Mario Kart an outstanding game at the time, but that its influence still echoes today. For that, it should never be forgotten, and nothing I can say could possibly take anything away from it. But, how does it hold up today? Super Mario Kart is superannuated. Ah, look at that! I've triggered Geek Words, the Geek Critique's inexplicable vocabulary segment. See, this is the stuff that I can only get away with now that Kalen's dead. Okay, superannuated means obsolete through age or new technological or intellectual developments. For video games specifically, I think it comes in two formats. The first is when some newer game in a series makes an older one seem outdated in comparison, which is actually a fairly common occurrence in the industry. For instance, popular opinion is that the original Borderlands is outclassed in basically every way by its sequel. Therefore, for most people, if you try to play Borderlands 1 after you've played through Borderlands 2, the first game's flaws will just be all the more obvious. It's been superannuated. But I think there's also a way that this may be wholly unique to games. There's a form that I'm going to call retro superannuation. This happens when a game was already superannuated by something else before it ever came out. This is Eminem's Kart Racing. You might notice that it's trying desperately to be something better, something that's a lot more well-known, something else, but it's just not getting there. Of course, this might not apply to everyone. I personally believe the PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale is superannuated by Smash Brothers by a massive margin, but not everybody feels that way. In other words, this whole thing is subjective. Now please keep that in mind when I say that yes, I can see why Super Mario Kart was so loved, and yes, it deserves the praise it gets, but I would honestly rather play any other game in the series. Well, aside from one, but we'll get there. I never got into Super Mario Kart when I was a kid. I think I might have rented it once, and I know my cousin and I played it occasionally, but I didn't really pick up the series until Mario Kart 64. It doesn't help that few games were more positively impacted by the advent of 3D than racing games. And maybe that's why, playing it now, it all just seems superannuated. 
There's this massive map taking up half the screen. The Mode 7 graphics and sprite scaling make it difficult to accurately judge distance, which results in some really nasty collisions. The controls also don't help. Using a D-pad for steering means that turning is an all-or-nothing game. And maybe it's because the course is made up of a flat background layer, but it feels sloppy and imprecise, like I'm floating above the world. Ah, oh, and the AI. I know that later games have their share of problems, but in Super Mario Kart, I feel more than anything like I'm racing against robots. Keep robots at that! Why does Peach get to keep throwing these drinking shrooms? And while as the series went on, item balance would shift further in the other direction, in this first entry, it almost feels like the items aren't powerful enough. Like, there's absolutely no hope of recovering if you get knocked too far back. The only thing that holds up for me is the music, which is still very appropriate and impressive. The Super Nintendo really did have an amazing sound chip. But other than that, it's just been so thoroughly surpassed by newer games that while I can appreciate it, I've never been able to squeeze a whole lot of fun out of it. Like I said though, it's all subjective, and my subjective opinion will always be that Super Mario Kart was totally and completely blown out of the water by... Mario Kart 64 brought the series to the N64 in 1997, and here's what I'm talking about with racing games and polygonal graphics. This was so, so much more than just a graphical upgrade. Hills, slopes, jumps, actual course geometry was now possible, making for tracks that could never have been possible in Mode 7. Like the first game, 64 has eight characters. Koopa Troopa's been replaced with Wario, and DK Jr. is all new for the 90s, growing up into Rare's design of Donkey Kong. Back then, games like this had a rule. The heavier your character, the better your top speed would be. But as weight and top speed went up, acceleration and handling went down. And since these weren't straightaways, smaller characters tended to be better. To put it simply, Mario Kart 64 is where I started picking Toad as my character of choice. I think character balance is a lot better handled these days, but I don't really even know because I exclusively play Toad to this day. Mario Kart 64 also beefed up the item system. Red shells were now much more likely to hit their targets. Triplets of several items were now possible. And oh yes, this game introduced the blue spiny shell, the bane of Mario Kart's item system. No matter where you were on the track, you could ruin the day of whatever poor schmuck happened to be in first place. But in this first appearance, the blue shell was in fact the rarest item in the game, and it could strike down other players on the way to first place. So while items got a lot more attention and power this time around, they still didn't feel game-breaking. What was irritating was the CPU. They no longer felt like mindless automatons guaranteed to come in certain positions, but they still weren't coded particularly well. When they were off screen, they would not only ignore the bulk of item damage, but magically speed up to get on your tail if they were too far away. They were better, but they were still cheap. I recognize that it feels very outdated now, and for a lot of people, it may be subject to the same superannuation that the original is for me. But what some see as blemishes, I see as endearing. It was kind of fun having to ward off the cheating AI all the time. I love the ridiculous glitchy shortcuts you can try. I even, dare I say it, love Toad's voice. With the game coming out so close to the N64's launch, Mario Kart would lie dormant for over four years. It wouldn't be seen again until the franchise's nine-year anniversary on August 27, 2001, when Mario Kart Super Circuit came out for the Game Boy Advance. This game is basically what would happen if Super Mario Kart and Mario Kart 64 had a baby. Don't think too hard about that. It featured the roster, graphical style, and item selection of 64, along with the Mode 7 style courses and gameplay that feels like an upgrade to Super Mario Kart's. It also introduced something that would become a cornerstone of Mario Kart's appeal, retro courses. Every single track from Super Mario Kart was unlockable in Super Circuit. And as awesome as that is, I feel like they really just served to highlight how much better the track design has become. You know, I never really got into Super Circuit back in the day. The biggest reason was probably that I could barely see it. The game came out in the heyday of the original GBA model, and that, combined with its similarity to the Super NES original, kept me from putting much time into it. But when I picked it up again in anticipation of this video, I was really struck by how solid the game is and how much fun I was having. Having longer, more detailed tracks and better items really does make a huge difference. And this is the best the AI had ever been to this point. It's not just a great portable game, it's a great game, period. Back then, though, I couldn't wait to play a brand new Mario Kart game on Nintendo's new system, the GameCube. Was my anticipation justified? 
Find out in part two of the Geek Critique's Mario Kart retrospective, which will be out next week. If you're not already, subscribe so you don't miss it, and like the video if you, you know, uh, liked the video. Check out some of the other content we've been working on, share the Geek Critique with your friends, acquaintances, and people you haven't actually talked to since Super Circuit came out, and you keep geeking, we'll keep critiquing. Thanks for watching. No, really, thank you, and congratulations. I've looked at the numbers, and people don't usually stick around during the end cards for very long. So you're a very unique person. Good job.